Boy, he certainly is a good God, is he not? Amen. 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 Would you guys show love for our worship team who's leading us this morning? It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a beautiful day as well. Guys, if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to actually close our series today, The Journey. It's been a real fun series, and we're going to continue to move forward in the things that the Lord has for us. Uh, So today we're going to continue uh, by talking about church leadership. We talked a little bit about church leadership last week, and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue to do that today. So do I have my um, keynote? Does anybody remember? Who remembers the scripture we read last week? Okay, I thought so. So we're going to read it again today from uh, Ephesians chapter 4 as soon as they get that popped up here. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read that. Justin, you ready to read? Okay, y'all stand up. There we go. Stand with me. Let's read together. Here we go. As a prisoner of the Lord, then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each party portion does its work. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it brings life, Father God, and your word is alive today. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would be very present today, Father, and I pray, Lord, that we would be able to grab hold of a word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're going to continue uh, today. I unpackaged just a little bit about church leadership as it uh, pertains to Springhouse last week. Uh, And today we're just going to talk very, very briefly about the pastor, about the, uh, the role of, of the pastor. We don't really see the term pastor in Scripture very often, very much. And, and that's because the word pastor comes from the Latin word that means uh, shepherd. It means shepherd, as if you were to shepherd the flock or shepherd sheep, okay? And so Jesus, over in uh, chapter 10 of, of the book of John, talks about being the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd, and he lays his life down for the sheep. And so anyone who takes on the title of pastor will take a beat from Jesus in terms of their role and responsibility being one that they lay their life down for the sheep. And so uh, last week we talked about also the qualifications of an elder and we listed those and we read those before we prayed over those uh, who are committed to, to being eldership over our house. Well, with regard to the pastor, the pastor also is, uh, these qualifications fit for the pastor because the term elder and pastor are somewhat synonymous in Scripture. We look, at, we look at Scripture and we see these qualifications fit both the criteria for elder and pastor. The biggest difference or distinguishing factor is that the 
pastor is charged with the responsibility to shepherd the flock, to shepherd those who is under his or her, her care. So how does one become a pastor? How does one become a pastor? Well, over in 1 Timothy, where we see these, these list of qualifications, he opens this chapter. The chapter is open by saying this. Here's a trustworthy worthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So it is possible for the Lord to put the desire in your heart to be a pastor. He can put the desire in your heart for you to, to want to do that. But, but the difference is it's not like you go out and you're seeking for a job. And let's see, I might want to look at McDonald's, a factory, or I might want to try this pastor thing out, okay? It's not one of those situations where you just put your resume out and you, man, man maybe, maybe a church is looking for a pastor. I can do that thing, right? No. God has a specific call for those who are supposed to be, uh, be pastors. Now, can pastors work at McDonald's? Absolutely. Can pastors work at a factory? Absolutely. There are people that are doing that right now and by, by, by vocational roles. The call of the pastor isn't so much about the title. The title of the pastor is less about what you are called and it's more about what you do. And so a pastor will be walking in that calling, walking in that, in that title far long, for a long time before they are actually bestowed the title. When you look at somebody who is a pastor, they have been walking in that calling for a while. I love recognizing people who are already walking the walk before they get the title and are able to acknowledge that. You don't get the title and then start doing the job, right? So pastors are already walking in, in that. This is why you will never see my face on a billboard around town advertising our church. And I don't mean to say anything against pastors who, who choose to do that, but I don't need to draw attention to myself because that's not where the attention needs to be. Pastors are to point people to Jesus. Pastors, a good pastor in your life will be pointing you to the word that's the roadmap, roadmap to your life and pointing you to what the Lord says. Now, sometimes pastors will share some things with you that you don't want to hear. And for me, that's happened in my life. Pastor Ronnie, on multiple occasions, has said some things that I did not want to hear, but they were things that I needed to hear because he wanted me to grow closer in my relationship with the Lord. And so when I meet people, when I meet strangers or people that I've never met before, I don't go up and say, hi, I'm Pastor Kevin. I go up to them and say, hey, I'm Kevin. Because the minute I use the title pastor, a big wall flies up in the air. Because unfortunately, in this broken world that we live in, the title of pastor has been abused and misused. And for, by some people, it's been used to manipulate people in the man's agenda. But the job and the role of a pastor is to point people not to themselves, but to Christ. Because the ultimate responsibility of a pastor, while the primary function of church leadership is to equip you for works of service so that body of Christ may be built up, the ultimate role of a pastor, those who are called to pastor, serve. Those who are called to pastor, serve. We have some today in our midst that we are going to ordain today and recognize as pastors, and we're going to, in just a second, call those up because they have, they have exhibited evidence in their life, the fruit, the fruit of their life, <laughs> right, is their walk of Christ. And so we here at Springhouse have a committee. Uh, Pastor Barbie Laughlin chairs the committee, and we have elders that are on that committee that have prayed for and who have, uh, who have looked at the qualifications of some of these individuals. So I'm going to ask Pastor Barbie to come, and she's going to lead us in this next section as we ordain a few of our brothers and sisters. <laughs> Pastor. In 2011, Pastor Ronnie and I just had it in our hearts to provide a way for those that we saw with a calling, um, a venue through which to gain their ordination, to gain their credentials, and we put them through it. <laughs> uh, they go through so many steps and so many classes and so many things to be equipped in it. Uh, I have been floored by their faithfulness, by their commitment level. We currently, since 2011, have credentialed 33 pastors. Yeah. We have those who are pastoring in, in numerous states. We have some missionaries. We have, God has just been faithful. And so these three today that we're getting ready to, and your lead pastor is one of those <laughs> who came through... Uh, in the past few years. Today, we want to bring up Justin Bashirs. Yeah. James Jensen. Yeah. 
and Sherry O'Day. If those who are going to stand behind and support would come uh, and stand with them, and then right behind them, if the elders could come and be a part. Here comes Arwen, Jeremy. Elders, would you join us as well? If you guys would take the shawls. You three, if you'll stand behind your applicants. And if you'll cover their shoulders with the tallit is the prayer shawl. Pastor Kevin will lead the charge. I want you three to face me. I'm going to read a charge to you today. And uh, if you will answer with I will after each one of these. Before God, before God, this thing has, there it is, okay. Before God, your pastors, elders, and this body, I ask you the following. Will you commit yourself to the faithful study of Scripture, giving yourself continually to prayer, so that you can both, all three of you, diligently follow and passionately teach the word of the Lord, obeying His commands to the best of your ability through His strength? Will you give encouragement, lend support, and offer comfort to those to whom he calls you? Will you be merciful, compassionate, a defender of those who have no helper for the sake of Christ and his calling in your life? Will you genuinely love God's people, serving them in truth through benevolent acts and with patient perseverance? Will you remain teachable? Submitted to God's headship and authority, as well as the sound and godly counsel to those who keep watch over you as ones who must give account. Will you walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? And finally, do you fully, freely, joyfully, and soberly accept this appointment, this office, and this calling with the pure intent of bringing glory and honor to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? So having been called and anointed by God and subsequently affirmed by the leadership of Springhouse Church, you have now committed yourselves to the work of the ministry. In light of this, our right and fitting response to your calling, your anointing, your equipping, and your commitment, it is now to move publicly to acknowledge what God has done by ordaining you to the office of a minister of the gospel. Would you all please stand and stretch your hands this way as we pray over these three. Father, we thank you for who you are, and I thank you, Lord, that you appoint and you call those whom you desire to serve in a variety of capacities, especially that of the pastor. And so, Father God, I ask, Lord, that you would cover each one of these, Father, today. I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around their families, God. And I ask, Lord, that you would use them mightily as they minister the gospel to both those who know the gospel and to those who don't. I ask, Lord, that you would surround them, that you would resource them, and, Lord, that you would give them favor with men as they go forward, Father, in your calling, Father. I ask, Lord, as they study the Scripture, new truths would be unlocked, Father, and that they would freely and liberally release those truths to the people that they lead. Lord, as a lead pastor of Springhouse Church, Father God, I trust these three, God, and because I know that you trust these three to be shepherds over your people. So, Father, I ask that you would use them, that you would bless them, Father God, and Lord, that you would completely surround them in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Springhouse Church, I present to you Pastor Justin Bashirs, Pastor Sherry O'Day, and Pastor James Jensen. Yeah. (laughs) 
God's going to do some things in Springhouse Church, let me tell you. He's been doing some stuff, and he's got some things ahead for us as well, including right now. Last week, we heard from two of our associate pastors, Pastor James and Pastor Barbie, and today we're going to hear from the other three associate pastors. I've asked each to pray for a word or a phrase for this season of Springhouse, and I'm excited about what they have to share. Would you all please welcome Pastor Will Severe? Hey, everybody. As you know, I'm Will Severe. I'm your worship pastor, uh, and this is my family. Uh, most of you know Tisha, my wonderful favorite person uh, that is living with me on this earth. Where is she? Uh, I love you, dear. Uh, you're my favorite. So, and these are our boys, uh, Liam, Bradley, and Anderson, and they're pretty wonderful. Uh, you know, Kevin asked each, each one of us to ask the Lord for a word or a phrase. And uh, for me, uh, the Lord gave me a word, and uh, I got it out of my small group, and that's not unusual. That should happen. You should have takeaways from your small group, just to let you know. Uh, but that word is instrument, and I'll be coming back to that. But that's, that's the word uh, for the next couple of minutes. Before we go there, I want to say, worship pastor, what does that even mean? So let me tell you how I can speak for myself. I, uh, other people might say worship pastor is something different, but this is how God has shaped my calling and the vocation that I, uh, that I serve in. For me, worship pastor is, is a calling and a vocation to cultivate a community of worshipers, uh, to spiritually shepherd that community, technically direct and logistically shape the worship leaders in the house and to lead that department as teams in serving the church in all areas of worship and the arts as instruments of and in submission to the Holy Spirit. So what is worship? Real quick, we don't have time in eight minutes to, to, to cover all of worship. All right, but I'll be real quick, okay? Worship is everything that we are. Resting or doing, silent and aloud, in mind and deed, living and breathing in a life of service to God. It's all of it. Worship is all you can do in a life of service to God. Praise, on the other hand, is the outward and active expression of approval and admiration. Praise is active. It's not silent. It's participatory. Now, uh, to set this up, Paul in Romans 6, uh, obviously he's talking to the Romans, and we can consider ourselves Romans, which are uh, Gentile believers, okay? Now, so consider this directly to us, okay? Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. We are instruments. We're either instruments of righteousness or instruments of wickedness. Now, the choice is ours. And none of us have reached perfection, as we know in this house. Don't fool yourself into thinking I'm talking to the big sinners. We're all the big sinners. <laughs> but we're saved through grace by faith, right? Right? An instrument on its own cannot make music. It will sit there. So we are an instrument, but we must play our instrument. So whether you realize it or not, you are playing your instrument. Some of us choose to praise our sports teams more than our Savior. And some of us, you know, if you go back to that definition I used, it, it doesn't necessarily say the Lord uh, some of us are more faithful in catching our shows than spending time with the Lord. We just are. Some of us read our novels more daily than we read the Word, maybe sporadically. Every day we have a choice to play our instrument, to worship God or not. It doesn't mean God will like you better or, uh, or he's no respecter of persons. It doesn't mean that everything will go right because in this world you're going to have trouble, Right? It doesn't mean that the storms won't rise, although it does mean we know who is with us in the boat when those storms come. I will say that it means life, a life of praising our Lord and worship in our lifestyle <laughs> is life more abundant. It just is. And um, I do want to close for a second. If, if, you'll, if that will be your takeaway is your instrument, who you are is your instrument, that the first half hour of our services every day is not our worship time. It's your whole week. 
I want to close with a prayer that's often attributed to um, St. Francis of Assisi, although I'm told it's not actually in his writings, so who knows? But it's okay because I like the prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. He had PowerPoint. I don't. But I have notes, yes. But I don't think I'm supposed to because he didn't have notes. But anyways, um, I, um, I'm Kim Walker, the kids pastor here. Uh, most of you know that because you see us on the screen often. Um, I get nervous doing this because um, I, you're adults. I've said that before. But um, I wanted to share and walk through a few things in my life so that with the word that God gave me that I kind of argued with him with, um, I really want you to know where I come from. Um, but I did uh, come here a year ago, January, right before COVID hit. So it changed everything for us in kids ministry and in the church. But um, it's been an adventure. Um, I have uh, two girls who are, one is 24 and one is 26. My younger one is Lauren. She lives with me here in Tennessee. My older one is still in California. And um, she is, uh, I'm hoping she comes here, but she, um, but that's where I'm from there in California. Um, how did I end up here in Smyrna? I got a call from Kevin um, one January. Uh, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to consider talking, kids ministry, some things like that. And I remember thinking in my head, uh, that ain't going to happen. I had a job that I liked. I was thinking of some other things. And um, I, I just said, Lord, you're not going to have me move to Tennessee now. And I shouldn't have said that. But what God did is um, about sometime within the year, and I may have, I have the timing maybe a little off, but God changed my heart. And of course it was his plan because here I am. And, um, but, um, so that was a big surprise and a twist in my life. I'm going to give you a few twists that happened in my life. And when I say twists, twists and turns, they're surprises, things that change the direction, things that we don't expect, things that might be fun, but also might not be fun. So in my life, some of the surprises is my dad went from a general, general contractor when I was in middle school and he became a pastor, totally changed our financial situation. Big surprise. Um, when, um, when I took a job in Tennessee at 20 years old and lived in Antioch, that was a surprise, but it also was a, I believe part of God's plan for bringing me back here for today. Um, when I took, uh, when I married Mr. Wright, just to walk through a horrific divorce later and had to learn, uh, God's restoration and forgiveness. When I fought for my daughters in a horrific custody battle involving abuse, and then I would have to learn what his miracles looked like when he had to fix things. When I um, raised two little hurting girls um, as a single mom, so unexpected, that was a twist, where God had to give me wisdom to deal with. When, I, um, when my sweet 10-year-old daughter prayed that I would work for a specific church it, that was 385 miles away from where I lived. Um, that was a surprise. And I also prayed for her as the Lord would disappoint her, I thought. But he, but he didn't. He brought me to my first pastor and kids pastor job in Northern California. Um, a few months later, what happened is a pastor called me out of the blue and I took the job. And I remember telling him, do you realize you are asking a divorced single mom with two hurting girls to be your kids pastor? And this was 13, 14 years ago. That didn't happen. And he said, yeah, he goes, I know you. And I think you can do this. I would be surprised when I would um, take that position. I was surprised when I got my credentials during that time. And a elder, um, it was part of the credentialing process, looked at me and said, you are a unique kids pastor because you have a gift because you can relate to kids in Christian family and in divorce situations and hurting situations. 
The first time in my life, I took that piece together and I looked at it and I went, that is what you did through all the craziness. You took that and you turned it for my good. And that was amazing. So during this time of, I can't, that situation, all the things that happened were big situations with a lot of twists and turns. But what God did is he gave me two constants in my life. The first constant was that I made a commitment to him. Am I hitting it? I made a commitment to him. And that commitment in relationship, I would never walk away. Even if I yelled, even if I cried, even if I hurt, I would not walk away from the God who made me and loved me. And sometimes I felt far away, but I made that commitment. I wouldn't go to other things. The second thing that I did is I made a commitment to never, I'm doing something on it, to never stop attending church, no matter what I was going through, and to never stop serving. And through raising little girls and dragging them to church and being at church, two services, everything in my life that I did, I kept those two commitments. Now, my word that, the God, that God gave me is commitment. And when he gave that to me, I said, that is not a fun word. I don't want to share that word today. And I did. I'm so sorry. I, and I, I did. I told him, I said, I really want to share something a little more lighter. But God just kept that on my heart. And that's why I needed you to understand where I come from. I've only been a pastor on staff for 13, 14 years. Other than that, I served and, and did that. And this is why I am telling you this, because Pastor Kevin has walked us through a journey where he's given us uh, guidance and, and things that are exciting on where we are headed as a church in this journey. It's going to take a commitment from all of us. It's going to take a commitment from every single one of you. And if I stand up here and give you this reason to have commitment, to make this commitment, then I, you need to know that I understand where, where you're at. I understand many things at my age. I've gone through many twists and turns. And I need you to know, I wanted you to know that I get it. So here's the thing that I wanted to say. There are, there are reasons that we don't make commitment. And I'm going to run through this quick. We don't feel qualified you're probably not qualified. If I had to be honest, I wasn't qualified to do what I'm doing. I wasn't qualified to serve. I felt embarrassed to be serving. And because my family, there was no divorce. But you might feel unqualified and you probably are, but those are the people God uses if you step up and you trust him. You might be scared of that word commitment when it comes to time. Your time, I don't have time. You don't have time not to be involved. Your time that you give to what God has, what you do with your time is what shows what is important. You have young kids. Your kids are, it's too busy. They're in sports. Your kids need to see you committing and serving. When you do that, I will tell you, and it is for my girls and my girls have had a journey themselves. But when they realized that they, um, when they saw me serving, they knew I believed in the church that I attended. I believed in what they were saying. And that's what your kids need to see. I'm gonna go faster. You, um, to take, make a sacrifice for you might seem to stretch you beyond what you could feel. And I know what that's like. I remember my kids crying on the way to church and, and we're trying to get in and then we get in and we're like, come on girls, let's just go. I mean, we've been through all the different things, but when you commit and you give God that time and you give him of yourself, you will grow. Your kids will grow. It won't be easy. It is hard to sacrifice. It is hard to commit. But there is an example that I will read right now from Mark 10, 45, that Jesus said, he said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wouldn't it be interesting Okay, I'm going to close it up. Wouldn't it be interesting? I have a timer because I talk in kids and I could just go on and on. But anyways, um, but Jesus gave his life and he could have, maybe he could have just come and just served us and loved and showed miracles, showed who God was, but he went the extra mile. And maybe for you, it's going to take the extra mile to commit, to sit in a service and serve a service, but find that place Make a difference. Watch what God does in your life. And it will, he will blow your mind with what he does with what you give him. Thank you. And the least for last. <laughs> Good morning. I'm only going to tell you a couple of minutes about myself because if you want to know me, let's go do coffee. I have an office here in the building and then my secondary office is at Carpe Cafe that I've used for years. But uh, 
I grew up in a very small town, about 2,200 people. For some of you, you go, that's a metropolis. But um, I've always been in church my whole life, except for about two and a half years of, uh, of prodigal season. Uh, but God restored all that. I've served in church since I was a child, whether it's helping in children's church or ushering as a junior usher or collecting communion cups after we did communion. All I've known is to be involved my whole life. Uh, Renee and I in May will be married 32 years, 29 happily. Three of them were a struggle, but God has redeemed those. I have three children. I have a son, 27, Jeremiah. I have a daughter who's currently in Guatemala now. She sends her greetings. 22, and I have a daughter in love, Eden, who by chance, I'm an outreach and missions pastor, came into our family four years ago through outreach and missions. That's how she and Jeremy kind of connected. So if you're looking, maybe you want to take a mission trip. Uh, my, now, to what I'm talking about, outreach and missions. This church has been involved in outreach and missions since the inception. It's always sent and planted and given and done in the community and around the world. And so the word I felt God gave me was generational. We have a heritage in this house. Flip through the pictures, brothers, because I don't have the clip. Here's some of the things we do now. You can see that we're wanting to do things that the whole family can embrace and be a part of. A uh, time of fellowship. It's not just all hard work. Do you know how much laughter was in that room that night? I can't even begin to tell you. But doing things, we want to involve our children's ministry and outreach in local fellowship. This is during the tornado, tornado in last year, and some of our mid-20s and teenagers went to Mount Julia and served on their own. They just knew it was a call. This is a group from about 12 years ago on a missions trip. Um, West Virginia, there's various ages. Missions and outreach is not people between 35 and 45 going and building something and making something better for somebody that's less than. It's about community and fellowship. Look at the variety of ages represented in there. This house is a house of generations. What good would a church be that's all 65 to 80? You'd be full of warriors that have done their time, but it's a little difficult between 65 and 80 and go to do. But we need their wisdom. We need your wisdom and your, your, your resources and your prayers. And you can come on some of these outreaches and just be a face there on the outreaches. We need that middle generation. We need that 35 to 55 because we need your strength and your wisdom and how to do things and think about things. Hey, you 20-year-olds, 18 to 30, we need you. You know why? Because somebody's got to pick up that 40-gallon bucket of paint because I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've done mine. I need to go, hey, Dylan Vaughn, grab that bucket, son, and we're taking it upstairs. Whew. But we also want to have things that involves our children and our local outreach here in the community. It's about family. And what is the third thing that Pastor Kevin said? Healthy family. Where's my God? Where am I at? I still got four. Worship team, if you'll come on out. There's 13 of us going to Mexico. Leaving Thursday. Don't clap. I want you to think about things and process. I can't go to Mexico. I can't go to Guatemala or Honduras or Cambodia. I'm just telling you all the places we serve. Kenya. We have missionaries around the world that we've been to and served with teams but can you come out with us when we do a food ministry? Or can you come out when we have our welcome uh, fall festival and come serve and pass out candy or hand out flyers? Can you go with us if we do something downtown for Smyrna Depot days? Or can you come with us and help feed or bless first responders? There are all kinds of ways to serve. And I don't have all the answers. So here's what I'm asking you. See, some people go, well, you should have all the answers. No. What is it that touches your heart? What is it that you may be passionate that you want to see us do? Call me up. Let's do coffee. Let's have a cinnamon roll. And let's talk about what God could do in this county and in this middle Tennessee region through Springhouse. Life happens here, but we want to take what happens in here out there where they are so that they will see Christ in us 
and the good works that we do and glorify our Father. And then they'll be drawn back in here to be a resource and a pool to go back. That's the goal of outreach and mission is to go and give the gospel, bring them to Christ, let them experience that, and then teach them to go get another. So if you're interested, this is not a 50-something ministry. It's not a 30-something. This is a generational tomb, womb to the tomb. I want everybody to be a part. God bless you. <laughs> We started this series by talking about how important community is. And one of the things that I want you to leave with, uh, in addition to all these rich words, is that you weren't created to be isolated and alone. We were created to be together in community. And so as we journey together, as we close this out, um, we want to do that together. God has such blessing in store for those who honor and walk in obedience to Him, who are chasing after Him. And you don't have to have it all together. Do you know that you don't have to have it all together all the time? How many here are in process? Anybody in process? Yeah, we're in process. But boy, what a wonderful thing to process alongside other people who are also in process. We'll get there a lot faster and a lot better if we do it together. Would you stand?